Most of the time, people who come to me with financial worries and troubles and stuff like that, I often ask them, where do you tithe? And maybe people don't even come to this church. And oftentimes what I hear is, well, I can't afford to. And so oftentimes what I say back is you can't afford not to. Well, it's just I can pay a bill with this or I can do, do with it. Yeah, but you're not having anything right now. That's why you're talking to me. But see, if we don't, see, in, in, uh, in the Old Testament it says obedience is better than sacrifice. And so if we obey quickly what God tells us to do, it gets us in, and this is just kind of remedial, but it gets us in line quicker for the blessing. And it's not that we have to work to get it. I don't believe that anyone here who said yes to Jesus is under the curse. I believe you're delivered from the curse of the law. I believe that poverty is a part of the curse of the law. I believe sickness is a part of the curse of the law. Well, then why do we see people who are Christians who are sick? Why do we see Christians who are poor? Because they haven't engaged the principles God set in place to be healthy or rich. And rich is not a bad word. A lot of times people think it is. But there is not one person in here who would reject a million dollar check if I gave it to you. No, no, I've got enough. I don't really need it. Well, that's baloney. You would take, you'd take it, you'd, you'd scream, you'd yell, you'd go to the bank. You, you, some of you, some of you logical ones would call the bank to see if the check was good first. But some of you would be, just get so excited about it, you'd run down. And I guarantee you, half of you would go down and get the cash out. I probably would too, honestly, or go get the gold or whatever. But <clears throat> part of God's system for our life is wealth. But I want to tell you real quick, i got a couple of points I just got to get to. One, I want to tell you, wealth is not money. Wealth is not money. Everybody say it with me. Wealth is not money. You can be rich without money. You can be wealthy without money. Wealth is an interior reality that becomes an exterior reality. Okay? And it oftentimes is manifested with money. Why? Because it's the main source of trade in today's economy. Now, I don't have any cash on me, but I do have these on me. Everybody else probably has one too. It's a debit card. It's a piece of plastic with electronic information in it that connects to my bank that says I have a certain amount of money in there, but my money has no value until I trade it for something that's of value to me. So money has no value until you trade it for, until you trade it for goods or services or until you start walking in fear where money's concerned. See, money, in it, who's got a bill? Who's got a, somebody bring me a bill of some sort. A dollar bill, a hundred dollar bill. If it's a hundred, you probably won't get it back. But if it's a dollar bill, we're good. And I'll, I'll give it back to you after service, Jim. Okay, so you got a dollar bill here. Nice, crisp dollar bill. But you realize, you realize how often this makes decisions for people. You realize how often people listen to the voice of the dollar instead of the voice of God. Why? Because they've given a fear value to this dollar bill that says, if I give this one away, I'll never get it back. Did you know that there's more $100 bills in circulation than there are $1 bills in circulation? But you'd never know that because most people only have these. There are more $100 bills in circulation than ones. But what happens is this is of no value. It's just paper and ink or whatever they make it out of in ink. And... Until you trade it for something that's a value. So I, I have, I just got this shirt, and um, I have an odd body. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of big at the top, and I kind of go down here, and it's just hard for me to find shirts that fit good. I have to buy, like, sometimes extra large shirts because of my chest, and then the rest of this is out here, and my arms are down to here, and it looks like I'm wearing a dress. <laughs> and so oftentimes, I have to get my shirts altered. I have to get them taken up. My mom in law has tried to do it. Other people have tried to do it for me. When Betty used to work here, or she, she, would, she worked for me. She also sewed for me, tried to keep me looking good because the shirts come down to here and it just looks foolish. But I found a place online called Modern Tailor where you can go and you can give them your measurements and they'll custom make a shirt for you. Your measurements and everything. So like even I can, this is crazy. I can put my sleeve down and button it and it actually looks like it fits me. I mean, there's, the fabric is there with the length of my arm, which is, you know, just awesome. Because before, there's a bunch of fabric bunch. You guys get what I'm saying. And so even like Amy, she has a longer torso and shorter legs. I have longer legs and a shorter torso. So anytime we sit next to each other, she always looks taller. And this is a real issue. When we do video together, I sit on a pillow. I'm not going to lie. I got issues. 
And, I, and, that, and that's probably one issue that's never leaving. I'm just letting you know. Like a kid, and you know, you don't have a, a booster chair, and so you sit on a phone book. Man, I, and, and you always got to make sure the camera's just up so much so you can't see I'm sitting on something. That's okay. I'm still taller than her. It's just when we sit down, it looks that way. But I finally was able to take 60 of these and trade it for something of value to me. Service and goods. <clears throat> so that's the only time that this has value is when you trade it for something. Or you become fearful of it. Then it has value to you, and you start operating in a place of fear, and actually you'll start going into a place of hoarding. So we will call them savings accounts. People will do savings accounts out of fear. Anytime you have a savings account based in fear for a rainy day in the future, I'm not saying savings accounts are wrong. Don't say it. Barry said don't save. I'm not saying that. I am saying that anything that has to do with money in your life, it's attached to fear, will draw less to you than you want it to. Because when you operate in fear, you're going to draw that very thing to you. And so <clears throat> I just wanted to throw that out there real quick. The next thing that I wanted to say, I'll give this to you after service. Next thing I wanted to say, that, and that's why in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, it says, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. In 3 John 2, it says, Brethren, or beloved, I wish that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Actually, it says, I wish, you, I wish that you would prosper in all things and walk in health even as your soul prospers. That tells me that before I will walk in health or prosperity, my soul has to be in a prosperous place. My soul is my mind, my will, and emotions. It's very important because your soul also encom encompasses your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind is what tells your heart to beat, your lungs to pump, and do all, you know, blood to flow and do all that kind of thing. thing. What we, what's happened is over the course of our life, you've been alive 30 years, for 30 years, if you are in a typical home, you have been taught to be fearful about not having enough, you got to work hard for what you get, and you've been taught, you know, you know, everybody goes through hard times, and this kind of thing, and that kind of thing, and so we develop a consciousness, a subconscious reality of negative things, and when we, in our mind, when we, in our soul is our mind, will, and emotions, our emotions get attached to what we believe will happen about in a negative area. And so we start attracting those things to us. And so what we have to do is retrain our mind. Just like uh, Romans 8, 2 says, it says um, uh, that you renew your mind according to the Word of God. You're supposed to be transformed or transfigured. Your mind has to be transformed into the likeness of God. It's not just going to happen automatically. But you can take the ideas of the word, the ideas of the supernatural, and train your subconscious to think that way. And that's one of the reasons I had everybody do this. Because the more you say something, the more you declare something, the more you'll believe it. And when you start believing it, it will come to pass. Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24 says, if you believe those things which you say, they will come to pass. But the key is believing. The believing is in the subconscious, what you really believe. Some people say they believe in God. Oh, I trust God. I trust God. Well, do you tithe? Well, no. I'm just not sure about that. Well, you don't trust God. Because if you really trust God, you do what he said. It's not what the preacher says. What I say makes, means precious little unless it lines up with the Word of God. We, you know, and I, I, I was going to say this in the first service, and I forgot you know, some people, after I preach about stuff that has to do with wealth or money or prosperity, come up and say, man, that's all you're preaching about. You're one of those prosperity people. Well, dadgum, I'm not a poverty person. <laughs> would you rather me teach you poverty? Or would you rather me say, you know, tell you how to lose? Well, heck no. Nobody wants to. But there's always that one or two, you know. They just get sideways about it. And, um, but the Lord prospered. The Lord was in health. I want the prosperity and health Jesus walked in. Jesus never had a need. He didn't. Did you know we're not even supposed to pray for needs? The Word says He supplied all our needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. All I should be praying for are my wants. He wants us to have every good thing. We're going to read some Scripture in a second. But your soul needs to prosper. And I want to tell you this just real quick. The more successful you become, the more you separate yourself from other people. There's going to be people that you thought were your friends, and when you become successful, they will not be your friends anymore. 
There's a lady in here this morning, uh, Jennifer Caudell. She uh, wrote a book, and she's uh, and I was celebrating her in first service. And she uh, wrote a book, and so it's about to be published and stuff. But I guarantee you there are people that were around her that will become envious and jealous of her success and separate themselves from her. But I want to tell you that, and let me read this to you because it was good. You have to determine at the outset of your dream that the rea- or you have to determine at the outset that the reality of your dream is more important to the kingdom than the ridicule of reality. You will receive ridicule. In Mark uh, 14, 4, 16 through 18, it says you'll be persecuted for the word's sake. Mark 29, 30 says that you will receive a hundredfold in this lifetime with persecution. So it should come as no surprise when something good happens in our life or we move up that there will be persecution. But the persecution always comes from people who want to say that they should have what you have, but they're not willing to give what you gave to get it. The haters. The people that just, you know, they gripe and they complain because they don't have this, or they don't have that, or they never get a leg up, and, never, and they're always pointing at other people, well, how did they get that? That pastor's driving a Hummer, man, I bet he stole money to get that. No, I went in debt like everybody else. <laughs> like a dope. I mean, I did. It's the truth. I don't, I'm not going to hide things from you guys and act like I'm in a place I'm not. Now I'm paying it down. I'm going to get it paid off quickly. But at the same time, you know, when I, and I'm kind of getting, getting into the later part of the message here, but I almost didn't buy that thing because, and I thought, well, I'll get one, but I'll get one with his regular tires because then people won't think it's such a big deal. And I'll get one that's a little older model and has a lot of miles on it because then they'll think, well, that's okay. It's not brand new. And then I was about to, I saw this one and I just liked it so much because I like big tires, jacked up trucks and everything. You call it a whatever complex, I don't care. Uh, and I have to climb up to get in it. I don't care. I like it. And uh, Amy hates it. She can't stand it because she doesn't like driving it. But that doesn't matter. It's not her. She doesn't have to drive it. But I, when I was looking for this thing, I was, I was trying to find something. And it was in Houston. And I thought, man, I really like that one. I like how it looks, how it sits, everything. And uh, so I started looking at it, looking at it. I put it away and for about a month, and then it went down in price. And I finally got, got them down to a, a really good price on it. But I almost didn't get it. Because I told Amy, I said, I don't know if I want to do this. Because, you know, people in the church might think something. They might think, you know, what's he doing driving this? Or where, is that, that's where my tithe's going. That's what people, you know, st- stupid. It's a stupid thought because I don't, anyway... But it's just like, if you allow the ridicule you think will happen to determine what you do, you'll never do anything. And so, I, and she, so she said, are you going to let what you think other people will say or do determine your decision? And I was like, well, no, I'm not. I'm not going to walk in fear. So I got it, and you know, I've had it for a while and everything. But oftentimes, I think we hold back talking about things, or we even keep ourselves from good things in life because of what we think other people will think about it. Now, chances are people don't think about you near as much as you think they do. That's really true. But even for those who do think something about it and want to cause a problem about it, that's okay, because the Word says that our success, our prosperity will come with persecution. Jesus was persecuted all the time. They gave him a hard time all the time. And so I, wanna, I just want to encourage you that to, you know, I, I said this last service, eagles fly alone. Turkeys fly together. <laughs> and they don't fly far. Turkeys are always in a cubby. The eagles fly by themselves. And I'm not saying you need to be by yourselves. It's important. I mean, we've got a church. I want people to come together. But at the same time, I want a group of eagles. I don't want a group of turkeys. <clears throat> I want people that are willing to fly high, to fly against the, the, the grain, against the wind, that are strong because they have a vision and purpose in their life that they want to see to come to pass. So it just separates you from people. That's all there is to it. Now, just real quickly. Envy, jealousy, and criticism will hold you back and keep you down. In your, in your trip to success, in your journey, these things will keep you down if you don't learn to truly celebrate the life of other people. For pastors, for Amy, uh, Amy sings, and they want to release an album. You know, Stephen, 
uh, the band wants to release an album and do that kind of thing. It'd be very easy to look at people who have already done it and say, I wish I had what they had. I wish I was where they are. You know, it could be, it could be that way for somebody that lifts weights. They, they look at Justice or, or Tony and they say, well, I sure would like to be that, but, you know, I just don't have the time. Don't, you know, we make excuses for what we could do. Because if you really want something, you'll make time to do it. And so, Amy and I have talked about more than one occasion, you know, it's easy to look at people and start comparing yourself to them. And, and Paul said in his word, don't compare yourselves among yourselves, for this is not wise. The reason is because it draws you off of your true goal. True, God, it, it calls you off of your, your gifts and your abilities in your life. Don't want to wear another man's armor. When, David, when Saul tried to give David his armor to go to battle against Goliath, David said, I haven't tested this. I haven't worn it. It's not going to help me. In fact, it'll get me killed. It could have been great armor. I'm sure it was the best. It was the king's armor, but it wasn't David's armor. You see, David was best suited going out with his sling, not a sword. Best go, you know, going out with his, with his bag, with his lunch and his, his rocks in it, not trying to armor himself up like a soldier. Why? Because that's where his power was. That's where his, and that's also where his experience was. Because he had used the sling, he had used his hands, his fists, to beat off lions and bears. I mean, that's crazy. But he knew this guy is no different than a lion or bear. And if God gave me them, he'll give me him. And so... Don't ever want to wear somebody else's armor. Don't ever be envious of somebody else. Always walk in humility when it comes to other people. And so I'm going to, I'm going to actually tell you a testimony today that I wasn't going to tell, um, but I am. Because what I, what I find in my life is that as a pastor, when good things happen to me, I don't want to always talk about them. I don't always tell people about them because I don't want other people, I don't want to give other people the opportunity to be envious or jealous or think, well, why is that happening to him? It's just a pastor and so that's happening because of that. Um, I want, and so... Because of fear, I don't tell some things. But that's not right. Because if, if, I, if I had cancer and the Lord healed me of cancer, you know I'd get up here and tell everybody. And everybody would rejoice and would get happy about it, right? If uh, we had this great debt that was on us or we had an IRS judgment or something like that and we were praying and believing and it was lifted or it was relieved, I would get up here and say it and everybody would get excited about it, get joyful about it. But if I've got five cars already and somebody blesses me with a Maserati and I get up here and say, hey, somebody just bought me a Maserati because God told them to, the response would be a little bit different probably. Now, I'm not saying with you guys, but typically that's the way it is because we see somebody blessed who's already blessed and we think, well, why are they getting blessed? I should get blessed. Well, that's envy. That's jealousy. It's actually covetousness of what somebody else has. It's the last commandment in the 10. It says, don't be covetous of another person's house, their wife, their things. Covet means to yearn or long for something with pleasure. Coveting is not a bad thing in and of itself. It's the object of what's coveted. So when you covet God's call on your life, when you covet the things that you believe he's called you to, it's not bad. It's only when you turn your focus and attention on somebody else and begin comparing yourself with what they have. But you don't know their journey. When someone's blessed with something, you don't know what they've sowed. You just see the one event and start judging them based on... We all have done this. I have done it. And start judging them based on that. And thinking, well, that's, you know, I've been believing for one of those. This guy's only been saved a week and God gives him one. <laughs> Dear Jesus, what's the matter? Did you miss? You know, you get, you get upset. You know, do you need a GPS to, to show me where, to know where I am or whatever? But the, the truth is, if we can't celebrate the blessings in other people's lives, we're not going to be stewarded with, we're not going to give the, be given the chance to be stewarded with the same blessings. <clears throat> Why would God bring something to you that you despise in somebody else? I heard Keith Moore say this one time, and it was so good. He said, when you see somebody get blessed with something that you wanted or something like, and you look at that, and you started thinking about reasons they shouldn't have it, you've judged yourself unworthy of getting it. Don't take yourself out of the line because of envy. I'm going to read you a scripture, and where did I tell you guys to go? Did I? Okay, go to, to John 12, but I'm going to go to James 3. I'm going to read this to you. Just go to John 12, put your finger there. This is important. Envy 
The, the definition of envy is this, a feeling of discontented or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions, qualities, or luck. Now, we know luck is non-existent, but that's the, that's the noun definition. The verb is desire to have a quality, possession, or other desirable attribute belonging to someone else. Jealousy. Now, jealousy is interesting. Jealousy is not a bad thing. Envy only is pointed one direction, and that's negative. Envy is always bad. Jealousy is not always bad. God is jealous for us. Jealousy, actually, in the Hebrew and the uh, Greek, it means to boil over. Passion. To, to, it's fervent heat. See, God has a fervent heat, a boiling over, a passion for us to be connected to him. I, I've, I'm, I'm jealous of Amy. I boil. I mean, there, there's just there's something in me that boils with love and passion for her. Okay? Now, if somebody gets around her and starts doing something, in fact, I, I heard not long ago, and she doesn't tell me things very often, things that happen to her, because she knows that I do things, and I don't always think them through. And, and, I, and I've done that before, and it embarrasses her and whatnot, and she's like, well, I could take care of myself. And I'm like, you're not supposed to take care of yourself. You're supposed to let me. You're supposed to let me take up for you and stuff. And she told me she received an email, a hateful email from somebody. I wanted to get on the phone right there. And get in the flesh and call them all kinds of names that I used to say 15 years ago. Wait a second, how long have I been here? 20 years ago. Oh, you know, it, why? Because I'm jealous for her well-being. She told me the other day, she wanted to take the kids to see a movie, and uh, she needed some money, and she said, will you pay half for the tickets? I said, yes. Yeah. So I gave her a hard time first. <laughs> then the kids came over. I was at the convention center, and uh, Trent came over, and I said, well, how much do you need? She said, well, it'll be about 40, so she just needs 20. So I gave her 40. Why? I want her taken care of. I don't want her to have to spend her own money. Now, sometimes she does, but in that moment, I didn't. Why? I'm jealous for her. I'm jealous for my kids. God's jealous for you. But there is a place of jealousy as an adjective under envy. And it means this, it's pretty much envy, feeling or showing envy of someone or their achievements and advantages. Okay? Now, in James 3, it says this, Who is wise and understanding among you, in verse 13, let him show by his good conduct that his works are done in the meekest of wisdom. Meek is not weak. Meek is humble. But if you have bitter, bitter envy and, and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. The wisdom does, this wisdom does not descend from above, but it's earthly, sensual, demonic. Envy is demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. That's pretty serious. Did you know that when you become envious of what someone else has, you'll get confused about how to get it? says it right there. Somebody gets a leg up and gets ahead of you in line on something and they get a, a blessing and you get envious about it. You've just thrown yourself out of line. You've, you've come out, you're further back than you were. Now, what this means is that word envy is zealous, which is also where we get our word jealous. But there's another derivative that this word in this uh, context is used. It's zemlos, which means, it means this. This envy, it grieves. It's actually a grief. Not because another person has the good thing, but that you don't have it. See, you get in grief, not that they have it and you want it, but that you don't have it. And so what do you do? You begin to turn your attention on what you don't have, and thereby you attract things to you you don't want. <clears throat> And it seeks to supply such deficiencies in himself. However, Zimlos, this attitude, may degenerate into a desire to make war upon the good which it beholds in another, and thus to trouble that good and diminish it. If you let envy take root, bitter envy take root, you will start trying to devise ways to see another person not have it. How can I take it from them? That's is serious. This breaches two commandments. You should not steal and you should not covet. Okay. Everybody okay? All right. Now, in, in, uh, in John 12, everybody there? Should be. <clears throat> Let's read this. 
This is an awesome scripture. This is an awesome passage. And it speaks exactly to what we're talking about. All right. Then six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus uh, was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Now I want to just, just real quickly understand this, that spikenard, <clears throat> this was an oil. Now what did I tell you? Money is just a means of trade. It's a thing. And why do we carry money and, and these around now? Because it's easier than carrying 20 chickens. Did I already say that in the service? No, no it's lesser. You know, it's easier to carry this than 20 chickens or five oxen. But see, in the olden days, it was gold, it was silver, it was ox, it was precious oils, it was stuff like that that they would carry around and they would trade or barter in exchange. So value had a lot to do with the way they traded. But now, because we use this, this in and of itself has zero value. You understand that? You would all agree with that, right? Yeah. Just like money. Till it's exchanged for something, for goods or service, or you get in fear about it. Okay, so this oil that this lady poured out over Jesus' feet, now you understand what she poured it on Jesus' feet. Why there? Because it's the lowest place of the body. And in those days, to get by someone's feet was actually, it was weird. It was disrespectful because it was the lowest place. And that's why when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, they were shocked. That's why Peter said, no way. You're not washing my feet. I need to wash yours. And Jesus says, you can have no part with me unless I wash you. And then he says, well, wash me all. You know, Peter was either all in or all out, one of the two. And that word actually means he can, you can have no part with me. That word part actually means share. In other words, you can have no share of the corporation of the gospel with me unless you allow me to do this to you. See, we all have a share. Some of us have 10 shares. Some of us have 20 shares. You understand what I'm saying? It's like a share of a corporation. But anyway, the lady comes and she dumps this on Jesus' feet. And, it, and immediately, the perfume goes through the whole room. The whole room smells great. Now, other than Jesus' feet smelling good for a few days, and the room smelling good for a few days, for that that ran over, and, Mary, and Mar Mary's hair smelling good, in a few days, this gift was gone. Whereas she could have taken it and traded it for something else precious. The value of this in today's currency is probably $12,000 to $15,000. So essentially, now if... If Mary had come and she, in today's time and she came to James and said, James, I love you so much that I'm going to take this gift and, I'm going to, and, so, and I want you to smell the wonderfulness of it. And, and if money smelled good, and she took $12,000 and put it in the fire. I just want you to smell this. We would all look at that and think, are you crazy? You could have taken that $12,000 and done this, 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 this. And if we're self-righteous, we'll say, that money could have been taken and given to the poor. We could have fed OTS with that. We could have done this. We could have done that. Well, someone else said something very similar. Right after she cracked this thing of oil over his feet. So let's read that in the next scripture. Now, listen to this. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot. See, we think we have these righteous thoughts, but we serve an extravagant God. You see, Jesus later on said, this story is going to be told forever. Throughout all eternity, this story will be told. Why? Because she did something out of love preparing me for my death. If I don't get up here and tell testimony, if I don't get up here and tell good things about what God's done, it gives nobody anything to hope for. And I want to tell you something, if I'm not telling the good things that God's done for me or having testimonies from people that are, good things are happening for them, you need to go to another church because it's not working. But sometimes I think, well, there's poor people or there's people really lacking. If they know I got this, they're going to feel bad. And I don't know if I should tell it because this, or if I tell them a lot of money came in, you know, $100,000 came into the church, they'll stop giving or anything. But you know what? Your giving is connected to your heart with God, not to what comes into the church. It's up to you. It's not up to me. He says, but one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii 
or 300 days wages and given to the poor. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, I always loved the love but Jesus. Let her alone. I guarantee you Jesus went, Judas, leave her alone. <laughs> you understand this was a holy moment. This was a sacred moment for Jesus. And when Judas said this, he solidified who he was. Do not let the spirit that ruled Judas come upon you when other people are blessed. It's serious business. Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial for the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. And the truth is this. The poor you will have with you always. They're never going away. But precious people in your life you won't have with you always. How many times at a funeral I hear, I hear stuff like, man, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. I wish I would have got them this. I wish I would have done that. Yeah, we're supposed to help the poor, and we do. We sow into the poor. I love giving to the poor. But you know what? I love even more than that. I love giving to people. That when I give them something special, they receive it with joy and gladness. Now, in Psalm 34, Psalm 34, this is important. He says this. You don't have to go there because I have a few more scriptures and I want to get finished with this. I will bless the Lord at all times. How many times? His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now listen, this is all together in these three scriptures. This is important. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. This is very important because, G, because uh, David is saying, my soul will boast in the Lord. Not my heart, not my spirit, my soul. My mind, will, and emotions will boast in the Lord. Well, what's boasting in the Lord? What he's done, the goodness of his life. And then it says, the humble shall hear it and be glad. Why? Because those who walk in humility walk close to God. And when they're glad about somebody else's blessing, they accelerate themselves in the line of blessing. Then he says, let us exalt his name together. Magnify God with me. And so when, when justice is blessed or, or Stephen is blessed and I hear something, I'm like, yeah, praise God. Man, sometimes people have gotten blessed with stuff. I got more excited than they did. When we started first reading our confessions about jobs, better jobs, checks in the mail and all that, People were getting checks a long time before me and Amy were getting checks. It was crazy. But I didn't go to God and say, look, I'm the pastor. I need to be the example. I need a check in the mail, okay? <laughs> no, I got excited. I was like, yes, even if it was a penny. If it was a rebate that was 50 cents, I was like, it's a check. Praise God, man, this is so cool. It got awesome. Yeah. And then we started getting checks in the mail six months or a year later. That's okay. You know that there's faith that brings results, and there's enduring faith that brings results with character. Yeah. Here's the difference. There's things I've been believing for for a long, long time. And when they come, I'll have the results and the favor with the character. When I believe in faith and something happens like that, which I love those too, it, you get a little less character with those. That's why when people just start tithing and giving, lots of times God blesses them right away. I mean, you see stuff happen to them, and it's so awesome and it's so cool. But he's drawing them into a disciplined lifestyle of giving. Discipline is not bad. Passion for God makes discipline tolerable. So anyway, the humble shall hear it and rejoice. We have to keep our hearts in a place of humility so that when we hear something good that happens to somebody, we don't want every evil and confusing thing in our life. Nobody wants that. But as soon as we walk in envy, we invite it in. We open up the door for it to come in. Okay. You know, I could, I could look at somebody down the street who has a bigger building, a bigger, more money coming in, and say, why they got that? How come we don't have more money? How come we don't have... You know, I hear about churches that are given buildings debt-free. And I'm thinking, what the crap? <laughs> but here's what... Then I'll get self-righteous and I'll say, well, it's because we teach a tough gospel. We teach, teach challenging. We don't just feed cotton candy. We feed vegetables. 
and I get this self-righteous thing going and this prideful thing going, well, that's why. Because it's harder for us to plow the ground. No, you're prideful, man. You need to repent. Get happy for them. Stonewater got given a building in, in Glen Rose. I had the choice whether to get happy or get crappy. <laughs> and I decided to get happy. I'm not saying I've always passed the test, but nowadays I, am, I get stoked when people get blessed because I want them to. When other pastors have bigger crowds than I do, or this or that. When somebody gets asked to go speak somewhere for a special event and I don't, I get happy. I get excited for them. Why? Because I'm in line. It's coming. I don't have to worry about that. In, in, in Romans 12, 14, bless those who persecute you. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. 1 Timothy 6, 17, as for the rich in this present world, instruct them not to be conceited or arrogant, nor to set their... And I'm going to ask you a question. Who was this written to? It says, charge the rich in the world. In the present world. Who is that? Somebody needs to say it. It's supposed to be you. <laughs> Why do people not want to say it? We've been mocked, boys. Guys, we have been sold a bag of goods when it comes to talking about money and wealth in church. That we shouldn't have it. But he wrote a letter to Timothy who led the church at Ephesus and said, Charge those in your church who are rich not to be haughty and arrogant. I don't, I don't, is it, you're hearing me? Are you hearing the words coming out of my mouth? Some people are just looking at me like, like you never read that scripture, it's in the Bible. In the new part too. Jesus. Don't be and don't put your hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly and ceaselessly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Dear Jesus, where we we've missed the scripture. I'm sure I never heard it in Sunday school. No, the poorer you are, the closer you are to God. There's just, there's just virtue in being poor. That is a lie. There is no virtue in being poor. But remember, wealth's not money. It's here. It's here. Okay. And then uh, Luke 16. Oh, and this is really good. I didn't get to this last service, and I'm almost finished. Luke 16 and uh, verse 11. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust true riches? Now, pay attention to this. And if you've not been faithful in what's another man's, who will give you what's your own? No servant serve two masters, for you'll love the one, hate the other, or you'll hate the one, love the other. Here's what I want you to pay, to pay attention to, because this is so good. When somebody gets something I want, it becomes my possession. They would say, how's that? You're not supposed to covet other people's stuff. You're absolutely right. But when Terry gets a blessing that I've been, he gets a, somebody gives him a pair, a set of ping top of the line clubs and outfits him and custom and everything. And I like ping. I mean, I really would like that. Not that I can even swing worth a darn, but you know, I want them. And I really, I'm like, oh, boy, man, Terry, that is praise God. You know, and you have a moment. There's always a moment when somebody really gets something that you want. Where you say, where there's this, that, that bitter or better. I'm either going to get bitter and envious, or I'm going to get better. And so I'll, and I'll be, in my heart, what happens is his possession now becomes a soul possession. Are you getting this? Because in your mind, you now have the choice what you do with this possession. It says, be faithful in what's another man's. Well, you have to be faithful in your soul, in your heart with what other people get. So I rejoice when he rejoices. You, you get that? Because if I don't, then I get in envy. And I start criticizing. One time we, um, when we were, first time we went to Romania, I um, uh, was standing at the back door I was saying bye to people. I think we were leaving that week. Some guy comes up to me. He doesn't go to church here anymore, so I don't try to figure out who he is. But he came by and he said, let me ask you a question, Pastor. Usually when people come to me with their chest stuck out, I know it's not going to be good. <laughs> and I'm short, so people are always looking down on me, you know. 
I may be short on the inside, buddy. I'm big on the outside. I mean, wait, flop those. <laughs> I may be short on the outside, but I'm big on the inside. I'm 10 feet tall on the inside. I should just get a box to stand on so I'm looking down on people. <laughs> you can't make fun of yourself. You can't, you, you got to learn. <laughs> anyway, and so let me ask you something, Pastor. No, if you're flying first class, are you fly, if you're flying first class, then how much poor could you help with that money that you spent on that? And he says it looking down at me and being mean to me. And I don't even get the chance to say anything. You just think about that. And he walks away. You stupid jerk coward. <laughs> don't even wait for me to say something. You were thinking and I just wanted to say it, you know. I wouldn't fly in first class, but I guarantee you, if I could have, I would have. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I got bumped up first class because of my dad's status with American. He's got three million miles, lifetime miles. And so he gets bumped up, stuff like that. Well, I happen to have the same name. <clears throat> and so sometimes, because of the name, I get blessed. Does it sound like anybody else? <laughs> because of God's name, I get blessed. It's not because of my name, it's because of his, because of his accomplishments and what he's done, the price he's paid. The same with my dad. And so we were headed back from England, and, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and we got bumped up to business class. It wasn't first, it was business. And, man, we were on, we were like, yes, sir, yes, sir, we've arrived. They even had slippers. I don't wear slippers, but I wore them on that flight. <laughs> I took my shoes off. I mean, buddy, I tell you, I got naked down in there and went to sleep. They gave me so much stuff to cover up with and everything else. Now, Amy would have, you know, but anyway, I not said that's not wisdom, but anyway. Now, listen, I've been driving Jesse Duplantis all week, so there's no telling what I'll say in this message. That guy, talk, I don't, some of the stuff he says, he must get beat half the time when he gets home by his wife. But anyway, um, so... We, we, and it was, wor it was great. It was wonderful. And so there's a couple of us. We went to Guatemala, right? And so Trent and I go to Guatemala. And we got uh, to go on miles and get, uh, we were in first class. And um, Trent, boy, he just, he's all about it. He loves it. He's ordering things all the time. Bring it. Keep it coming. Keep the nuts coming. <laughs> Bring me the tenderloin. You know, he is, he's got no, he has no shame when it comes to getting what's his. And, uh, and I, you know, I should like that about him. Sometimes I want to slap him. But um, <laughs> so anyway, we're driving from uh, Guatemala City to Cates Altenango. And it's, uh, it's, it's cold. And it's cold in the van. And he lays down to take a nap. And I look back. He's got like two or three blankets on top of him. I'm like, what the? Where'd you get those blankets? He looked up at me and said, well, they were in the first class cabin. I just took them. I figured they were mine. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, because they put them in the plastic and put them in your seat and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I said, but you have three. He said, well, some people didn't take theirs. I figured, you know, <laughs> might as well take mine. I just, I do and, uh, and, and we, so then we're headed back, and we're on the flight headed back, and I look over at him, and I have a blanket, and I said, you want this? And he says, no, I already got another one. Four is all I need. <clears throat> I'm just like, you got to be kidding me. But, it, you know, it's, it's made for a funny story. But he, he took advantage of being treated well. And some people have a hard time being treated well. Well, I don't deserve it. Well, Dad, I'm right, you don't. Neither do I. But we deserve it because of him and the price he paid. Okay. Now. Listen to this. Our success and favor can never be sustained independently of the true source. And let me read this. I didn't get to this scripture last service, but this is so good. Let me read this to you. You have to be faithful in what other people get, and here's why. Sometimes you don't get the things you want because you're not ready to receive them with character. Yeah. Proverbs 27, 21 says this, amplified. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace is for gold to separate the impurities of the metal. And each is tested by the praise given to him and his response to it whether humble or proud. You see, sometimes we don't get the things we want because we're not ready to receive it because we get lifted up in pride thinking we had something to do with it. <clears throat> I 
You can't condemn and criticize wealth in other people's lives and pray for it in your own. You're repelling what you're praying for. You should be praising God for blessing them. So I'll end with my testimony. Everybody's susceptible to this. Everybody. So this last week I drove, like I said, I drove Jesse to plant us around at this conference and listened to a lot of great speakers, got to meet a lot of really cool people. I want you guys to know that because it's available for anybody. Whatever you have a desire for, God has a delight in. He want, he, he's delighted to give you the good things. He wants you to have them. And if I don't tell you about things that happen in my life, then I'm disservicing God and his goodness because Romans 2, 4 says it's the goodness of God that draws men to repent. So anyway, over my life, I've, especially the last 10 years, I've really been a giver with a lot of different things. I give money away. I give all kinds of things away. And I'm not saying that to boast. I'm boasting in God because he's made me wealthy to be able to do things. I want, uh, you know, when, uh, when Quidditch Sheba was leaving Solomon, after Solomon had given her so much, she said, the Lord has favored you because of the people he loves. See, God will pour favor on my life because he loves you. God will pour favor on Tony's life because of those people that he influences. The, see, the favor is never supposed to stop here. It's supposed to flow through. The favor is never supposed, I, if it stops with him, it becomes a dead sea and can't produce anything and nothing can live in it. The favor is always supposed to flow through us to somebody else. The blessing always flows to other people. And so um, about a year ago, I gave a pair of boots, nicest pair of boots I'd ever had. They were, uh, and I hadn't worn them that much. And I had the original box and all kinds of stuff. And I gave them to a guy that I really loved and believed he would like them. He did. He sent me a picture of them. He was all styling in them. He's, you know, they were full quill ostrich, a cognac, full cognac color, full quill ostrich, Ariat, had a, a blue shaft, and it was just a gorgeous boot. And I'd saved up to get them. I'd paid a price to get them, but I knew that he would love them. He did. And that brought joy to my heart, to see him smiling and wearing them, okay? And I, I forgot about it. Now, I want to tell you, don't ever forget about your seed, but forget about your seed. And what I'm saying is this, know that it's in the ground, that it's always growing, but don't always be worried about not getting the harvest on it. Okay, so I'm always cognizant of the things that we've sown, the money we've sown, but I'm never, you know, just uh, all I'm thinking about. So while we were at the conference, this couple came in, and real humble couple, and they came in, found dad and said, hey, we, we build custom boots. And so we want to measure Brother Copeland, Brother uh, Kenneth, Jesse, Jerry, Keith Moore, and then they said, and we want to measure you, too, to my dad. Now, I was super excited for my dad because my dad is always behind the scenes. He's always doing things. He's always serving. He's always doing. And, and he tells me, well, I'm not going to get mine because I don't wear boots. I said, are you crazy? <laughs> custom boots, Dad. If you wear them once a year, you could say, I have custom boots. <laughs> well, you know, I said, then give them to me. I'll take them. And he said, and later on in the day, he said, you know, if, I don't want them. And if you want them, I'll, I'll ask them if they'll measure you instead. And I said, I'll take it. I am not going to be shy about receiving a blessing. Amen. And so anyway, so later on that day, uh, they're measuring Brother Jesse, and he's talking to him. And he got this, these boots. They're black cherry ostrich, black cherry ostrich. And they are rare. And actually, after they break in, after a little while, you can actually see the veins in the boots. And, uh, and, and he was telling, he was measuring him, telling him all about everything. And Jerry's, or Jesse's, I just want black, black this, black that, everything black. I'm like, get, get imaginative here. You got a chance to make your own boots. And he would, but he, everything black. Well, he said, these normally would cost $3,000. And I thought, I'd go, whoa, praise God, man, that is so cool. And so he's measuring a few people. My dad did end up getting, he did get, end up getting measured, thank God, uh, because he needs to receive. And, uh. So anyway, um, these guys needed to stay another night. So I took them to the room and I took care of them and I made sure that they had stuff for breakfast the next morning. They were in their room and everything. And we were just talking. And as I was leaving, the guy says to me, you need to start thinking about what you want. And I said, what do you mean thinking about what I want? He said, well, we're going to build you a pair of boots. I said, really? I said, buddy, I've already been thinking about it. I know exactly what I want. I had already, it's running through my mind. I said, did my dad talk to you? He said, no. I said, oh, this is even better. Because the Lord told him. The Lord moved on them. 
And he starts telling me about all these different skins and everything. So the next day, I went and I got measured for them. And they're you know, got a 10 inch shaft, all this. They're going to be red with white piping and, and cream <laughs> stitching. And oh man, they're going to be cool. And they're going to be made with caffeine elephant. I've always wanted a pair of elephant boots. Now, this, this, this elephant in particular was a rogue elephant. And it was killing villagers and all kinds of stuff, so they had to take it down. And they send the picture, and I've actually got a picture if anyone wants to see it after service. It's the trunk. And he just happens to get this trunk, and he didn't, you know, he hadn't had anybody make boots with it. I saw it, I said, that's it. That's what I want right there. So caffeine is a brown, brownish black. And so, man, I'm, I'm, in, I'm going to be styling. I'm, I'm getting Wranglers again. <laughs> I can't fit in them very well, but I'm going to get them. Amy's going to be mad, but anyway, um, but, but I'm telling you that because if we rejoice together, what will be my possession, because it takes a few months, can be your possession. Because if we celebrate together, that means we're together in it. Now, I'll tell you, I asked him, how much would these normally cost? He said, $5,000. My jaw dropped, my heart skipped a beat. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. But he said, no. And, and all together, they sold $35,000 worth of boots. Wow. Well, they didn't have $35,000 to sew, but they worked with what they had. Yeah. When, when we work with what we have, that's, you know, remember that, that commercial for uh, Capital One, Samuel L. Jackson would say, what's in your wallet? Well, that's, that's my question to me and you guys. What's in your wallet? What do you have to do? What do you have that you can do with? And so I sewed a $400 pair of boots, and I reaped a $5,000 pair of boots. And I didn't, there was no manipulation, there was no trying to get something, it was just God. It's just the favor of God. And that, that was really the last thing. What do you do, how do you handle something when somebody gets something that they didn't work for? It was just favor. It was just because somebody loved them. It's important that we handle those things with delicacy, victory, and we are so genuine in our praise to what God did for somebody. Because yeah. you never know where somebody's at, what a blessing something is in somebody's life. So everybody stand up. Praise God.